We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning and depends on the time zone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for coming. I would like to cordially welcome all participants uh, here gathered in the audience and those who are following our event online. Uh, let me check with uh, our technical team whether our panelists online are with us. Do we have all panelists on board? Could you confirm, please? Mr. Pablo Castro. Ms. Catherine Jones and Dr. Patrick Pavlak. Yes, they are here. So we have an audio and we have uh, we have video. Okay, I think that we can officially start our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, since the frequency, uh, I would say complexity and sophistication on, of uh, malicious cyber activities in the cyberspace have been steadily and uh, constantly growing. The international uh, community seeks uh, a proper way to address this issue and to cope with this dangerous phenomenon. Uh, the international debates are ongoing in different fora and at different levels, starting from the United Nations level through regional organizations and including non-governmental multi-stakeholders. Today we are going to speak on initiative program of action for advancing responsible behavior of states in cyberspace. This is an initiative led by France and Egypt, which currently is supported by 54 states. And this is another attempt to find and to set up kind of international global platform, international framework for addressing cybersecurity issues in more practical manner. And practical is a very important word in this context. We invited representative set, representative makeup of panelists to address this issue. We have one panelist with us on site, uh, Mr. Ambassador Henri Verdier from France. And we have three panelists online. Let me briefly introduce them. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Verdier is dealing with digital affairs at the Ministry of for Europe and uh, Foreign Affairs of France. He is very experienced diplomat. And as a matter of fact, he's one of the masters of program of action. Online, we have uh, Ms. Catherine Jones, uh, representing Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. Uh, Catherine is the head of unit at the FCDO and uh, she has a long experience in dealing with telecommunication and digital affairs. From the Western Hemisphere, we decided to invite Mr. Pablo Castro, who is career diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile, and who is supposed to tell us more about the regional dimension of a program of action. And last but not least, Dr. Patrick Pavlak is today with us as well. He is Brussels Executive Officer of the EU International uh, Institute of the EU International Studies. And we expect that Dr. Pavlak will give us a little bit more of uh, scientific um, we will look at this issue from the scientific point of view. Uh, 
Uh, let me start with the first uh, question, the same question which I'm going to address to uh, each of uh, panelists. I think that we can all agree that the current year, uh, 2021, was quite successful in terms of the results of international debates on cyber uh, security issue. Uh, two important uh, reports uh, have been adopted. First, by group of governmental experts, actually six, sixth edition of, of, of GGE. And the second one by uh, open and that working group. Moreover, Russian Federation and the United States have decided to table within the first committee of the UN General Assembly, common draft of resolution dealing with cyber issues. And it was a mm, successful step because this resolution was adopted without voting. And my first question is as follow. In this, I would say, geopolitical context, in your view, what makes program of action still attractive and still needed? And I, I'm asking first uh, Ambassador Verdier to, to answer this question. Please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to warmly thank Poland for convening this panel on the POA initiative. This is a most timely and useful opportunity to discuss this initiative, to clarify its objectives and further elaborate on its possible content, including, and that's why that's so important to have this conversation within the IGF with uh, all interested stakeholders, such as states, private entities, civil society, researchers. I say also a great hello to my friends and counterparts um, UK, uh, Chile, and uh, Poland are one of the first uh, co-sponsors to, to, to support this initiative. So we are a team now, <laughs> and uh, we work together. So I, I will be brief, but your question was a small explanation. Because, of course, during the past few years, we uh, no, no, the past 20 years, we have collectively achieved a number of important diplomatic results in cyber talks at the United Nations. And yes, as you said, the last open-ended working group and the last uh, governmental expert group have adopted uh, substantive final reports, very important, which reaffirms the applicable framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace which deepen the common understanding of this framework and offer guidance for its implementation, as well as useful recommendations on confidence building measure, capacity building, and international cooperation. And we do welcome and we do respect uh, those the results. So, uh, when I try to explain to my daughters <laughs> why you, those processes uh, matter, and why I have to leave France for such long periods. I say that probably if we didn't have a, a real cyber war during the last 20 years, it's because of this work in the United Nation, because we understand each other, we agree on norm of good behavior, we explain uh, the level of aggression, the level of escalation, uh, we, we, we exchange about attribution, so that, that's very important. And yes, this year, during the, this fall's first committee, <coughs> these two reports has been endorsed by uh, General Assembly in a single consensus resolution. So yes, we understand also that after the trauma of a dual track process during the last three years, it's not time for no one, and even France, want a new dual track process. But, and I want to take a few times to explain this, we are not speaking about a dual track process. We are, done, we are not speaking about two concurrent tracks. We are speaking about a second approach, complementary to the first one. And to mention this, in the final consensus report, both the Open Ended Working Group and the DGE have noted this proposal for a program of action and recommended to further elaborate this. Because 
I will start with a very simple uh, analogy, which is not in my paper. <laughs> Let's think about what's happened in our in real life, in our quotidian life. <laughs> the police does protect us, but we close the doors and windows of our houses. So we need a certain level of security to make possible for the police to protect ourselves. And to, to make it simple, in the cyberspace, we didn't work enough about the, 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 strong, the strengthness about the resilience, about the quality of the cyberspace itself. We didn't engage enough effort to, to exchange with the companies to have a better IT. We need the companies to agree together on norms on good products or contracts. We need to work with the states to help those who need this to build serious capacities. I'm speaking about CERT, about cybersecurity agencies, but also good laws, police, justice. We need to, to build data together to help research, to understand forensic, forensic security, et cetera. Maybe we need to, to build together, um, uh, for example, an index of cybersecurity to understand where we are weak. And um, so that, that's the idea of the POA. The idea of the POA is to have an action-oriented, concrete body within the United Nation to not so first to implement the good ideas, the good resolution of the open energy working group and DGE processes. And yes, there will be a second open energy working group and we will continue together to elaborate uh, better norms, better confidence building measures, better understanding the, of, of the norms and international law. But we need also, and also within the United Nation and also within a inclusive uh, body uh, to work to build concretely uh, a better cyberspace. And so the program of action is a status that does exist within the United Nation. For example, it does exist a program of action for small arms and little weapon. Uh, this kind of status has some advantages. First, I don't know if everyone knows this, but when we launch an open networking group or a GGE, we decide for three or five years, we, 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 the, the, we nominate a, a chair, but we have to renegotiate every year and we don't have a permanent chair or a permanent team. So first we, we need, an, and, and there is, we, I did participate to two of these processes. There is a, a final week of negotiation effects. So everyone prepares the last week. <laughs> so everyone, so the last month we do prepare the last week, the last year we do prepare the last month. There is a lot of and too much strategy. So if we have an endless pro program, we have to deliver <laughs> every year <laughs> because we don't have this uh, finite line uh, effect. And then we can have a, a permanent body. And because we have a permanent body, we can build some tools. For example, the, the POA for small arms and little weapon publish the, the index of disarmament every year. And so that's uh, an official function of this POA. So I consider that we need this, um, this complementary tool and both of them, the new open ended working group and the POA should be very inclusive and used by everyone. And just to conclude, because maybe I'm a bit too long, um, I consider, maybe we will exchange about this, that we, we, we could mention two in particular eras which a POA may be needed as an effort complementary with the open-ended working group. Firstly, concretely supporting the capacities of states to implement agreed cyber norms. So the GGE, the open-ended uh, open working group, did recognize that the international community's ability to prevent or mitigate the impact of malicious ICT activity depends on the capacity of each state to prepare and respond. But to, to build this concretely, we need to open a, a st work stream. Every state should be encouraged to express their needs and identify capacity gaps they face and implementing UN uh, solution. 
for example, we could use uh, tools such as the National Survey of Implementation that was promoted by Mexico and Australia during the Open Agile Working Group. And then we'll be able to target cooperation action. And then, and I hope that GPOA will, will have money, will be able to give money to, to finance capacity building. And the second point is that, yes, those processes, POA or um, Open Agile Working Group, because we speak about international law, we are a bit open. We consult and listen to the civil society, but we cannot be as open as we need because we cannot decide international law with the complete multi-stakeholder community. We can exchange a lot, but we cannot vote all together. But when we we'll speak about concrete security, norms of good practices, uh, actual implementation, we will complete uh, our capacity building, we will completely need the civil society, the multi stakeholderism, and we intend with all the co sponsors to build a really uh, multi stakeholder uh, body. <laughs> so we, we will have to discuss, that's why it will take one year. We intend to propose this uh, in the next UNGA, but to, 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 to organize a, a governance. Uh, so for example, maybe we need a permanent forum of civil society. Maybe we need to create a status of observator for the civil society to the, the part that involves states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those two very important issues: how to organize a targeted and precise and efficient capacity building support, and how to build a concrete and solid governance with the multi-stakeholders as two are two important parts of the POA. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your comprehensive answer and these explanations. Uh, let me just underline maybe three elements. Uh, you've mentioned that uh, POA is not uh, a dual track process with OEWG. This is a very, very important uh, statement. Secondly, this is the complementary approach. And uh, you mentioned also capacity building as a, as a perspective, the most prospective goal of, of, of program of action. With the same question, uh, the same question I address now to, to Ms. Catherine Jones. Uh, please, uh, we are uh, interested in what is your perspective concerning, uh, concerning uh, the role of POA in the current uh, geopolitical context. The floor is yours. Thank you, Minislav. Um, it's great to see everybody. Um, and uh, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you uh, today. Um, it's always great to hear uh, Henri uh, and Bastia Verdier talk about his vision um, for this, this project. And um, we're really um, excited to be able to, to play into this, this work. Um, I think starting with your, with your question, Miroslav, 2021 was indeed a lot more successful than many of us could have hoped. Um, and uh, I think we would sincerely welcome the consensus reports and the resolution that we secured this year. But we also mustn't be complacent. Those processes were really hard fought. And at many points, this very welcome situation we find ourselves in didn't seem totally um, attainable. Um, so we remain quite clear eyed that although we've overcome the disappointment of um, not finding agreement in 2017 in the previous processes, um, there's still a lot of work that we need to do together uh, to cement that um, progress. Um, for us uh, in the UK, we've had disagreements um, uh, with uh, various countries about how to move forwards in, in this work. But the reason that we look towards a program of action as, a, as a, a viable proposal in this space is that any approach that takes us forward, that builds on those areas that we do agree on and continues the progress that we've made without reverting back constantly to those fundamental disagreements, that has to be really welcome. And so it's within this context that the UK thinks um, that a program of action could make a really significant contribution um, to our shared aim of upholding stability in cyberspace. Um, the core benefit of a program of action for us lies in its ability to deliver practical change, as Henri was saying, um, by focusing on the implementation of agreed measures. Uh, so in our case, the international community has already agreed an effective framework for responsible state behaviour in cyberspace, and that can guide states in their actions. 
But to support our shared aim, all states have to be willing and able to implement that framework. So assessing our national progress against the framework and identifying shared challenges, capacity gaps, best practice and expertise on these issues is crucial if we're going to move forward. The international community's ability to prevent or mitigate the impact of malicious ICT activity, as Henri already said, depends on that capacity of each state. So we have to strengthen international cooperation and we have to support the capacities of all states uh, in an inclusive and coordinated and efficient manner. Um, and that's the change that we think the programme of action could deliver here. The challenge for many states of implementing the framework when they only have limited capacity can't be overlooked here. It, it's a real, real challenge for, for many. Cyber skills, whether we're talking operational all the way through to policy, are a constrained resource. Um, and of course, secure and well-maintained infrastructure, which supports the latest technologies is very costly. So a really strong capacity building focus um, to a program of action will be a precursor to its success. The political declaration and high level engagement that usually accompanies a program of action process is therefore an opportunity for states to raise cyber up the national and international agenda. So consolidating and leveraging greater political awareness and commitment at the very highest levels will help all states um, secure this topic the priority that it deserves and ensure that our international cooperation truly does deliver. And the UK also believes the time has come for the UN to commit to regular institutional dialogue on this issue in a way that sets out a roadmap for our future engagement. It's really important that our roadmap that we set out can't be static. Um, it has to be sufficiently flexible to remain in step with the latest developments in technology, which we know we have, you know, progress is so quick. It has to work with the exponential advances we see in technology to preempt and to respond to risks and safeguard the tangible benefits of cooperation in cyberspace. We believe that the programme of action can meet that need for flexibility. Um, through its combination of review conferences, which set the programme of work for the, for the strand and the technical meetings. Importantly, those review conferences provide a periodic opportunity to assess whether additional actions might be necessary to review work plans and priorities and implementation, and to ensure that the programme of action remains relevant and responsive to states' needs. But the roadmap also has to provide for action rather than argument. To date, all of the UN forums on international cybersecurity are deliberative processes um, that have existed to create dialogue and exchange rather than to take action. And the time for focusing only on discussion is past. Um, we must now implement agreed cooperative measures to address the threats that we see in cyberspace. But of course, we continue to also need dialogue, and that's where Henri's comments about um, this not being a dual track process um, are particularly important. Dialogue provides a foundation of our cooperation, and that's why the POA should provide for states to decide to update the framework um, by including new principles or recommendations and commitments if consensus agreement is found in another UN process, or by consensus agreement during the review conference. But there's really no substitute for strengthening global capacity and practical cooperation. We can't afford to hold up practical efforts to increase our shared security whilst we nurse those long-standing differences in approach that I referred to at the beginning. The UK believes the programme of action will enable states to make progress and cooperate in practical ways, whilst also building platforms that support any future agreements, and that's why we support it. Thank you, Marislav. Thank you very much, Kat, for presenting your perception of uh... POA and importance. Uh, you've mentioned many important elements, uh, to some extent complementary to what uh, Mr. Ambassador said. Let me just uh, mention uh, your fundamental question: how to how to move forward this process, which is very important. Uh, secondly, how to overcome capacity gaps. Then, uh, how to start how to raise political awareness and how to start regular institutional dialogue. And now I'm asking the same question, um, uh, Mr. Pablo Castro. And thank you very much for joining us, first of all, but because I guess that uh, in your time zone, it's uh, relatively early 
Uh, I don't know what time is it it's in Chile. Oh, thank you very much, Miroslav. No, it's uh, eleven ten, so it's not uh, 11, so. 10, so not so bad. And it's summer. And it's summer. <laughs> okay, thank You're you. Right, okay. Please, Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miroslav, for this invitation. Also, say hello to Kat, Patrick's very good friend. Also, Henri, bonjour, Henri. And um, well, I have to say, I fully agree about what Kat and Henri already said. Uh, it's very um, complete, and. Even, I mean, from the perspective of Chile, and, and I have to say, in some way, from the perspective of Latin America, of course, when a, uh, what the POAs offer in terms of concrete actions, you know, implementation, it's very, very important. And I think it's quite timely. Um, in my work, for, instance, for example, when I'm um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, when we're trying to, of course, work with other national agencies, trying to, you know, invite them yeah, in this uh, United Nations processes. Uh, sometimes they see those discussions, as Kat said, just like a dialogue, very interesting dialogue, but not a real concrete measures. And those agencies sometimes very technical. So they're very concerned about to get corporations, collaborations. For them, cybersecurity, it's about, you know, to face our uh, threats and incident all day. So the question is, okay, how it's so, I mean, how this discussion about application of international law or norms is going to affect my work and our uh, national processes. Uh, and of course, my job is trying to convince them to say, yes, this is a very important discussion. It's going to affect also your work and our um, national policies. But if they're always asking about what else, what are the concrete steps we are taking on this? Why the, where is the, um, you know, the, uh, the international collaboration? Where's the implementation? So I think uh, in, in that case, the POA makes a difference. You know, what it's offering is basically it's something for, and I think it's also, we say that, I, I don't know, it's just maybe my feeling. There is a sense that after maybe 20 or more years of having this discussion as you know, the national level on the first committee, we definitely need to move on and start to do um, more concrete things, steps. And um, it, from the perspective of Latin America, capacity building is quite important. It's essential. I have to say that probably it's the most strategic aspect of our discussion on, on, on cyberspace and cybersecurity because it's allowed to you also to face better other discussions. Uh, for example, the, uh, the whole discussion, the application of international law, five years or six years ago in Chile, we're not me, possible able, I mean, to, to, to develop our national policy or to have some kind of positions. Right now, thanks to the training of the capacity building was offering, especially for the uh, organization of American states, you know, uh, we have especially expert on the government, even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So now we are ready maybe to move on for, uh, to develop our national positions. So capacity building is actually a strategic factor, you know, it allows to you to move on on cyber. And I think the POA is putting, I mean, the, uh, the main focus on this approach. Um, I'm very optimistic. That's probably the reason I'm very optimistic about the future of the POA, because and maybe this is, what I'm gonna say it's very ambitious, but I think uh, the POA in some way is the next step of the evolution in our multilateral discussions. I think sooner or later, states gonna understand that what the POA offers is what exactly what we need right now. Uh, and we definitely will need it in the in, in coming years because I don't see the situation is getting better in terms of what was going on in cyberspace right now. Geopolitics are, every day is more complicated. It affects the cyberspace. So the challenges are every day more difficult to face. So, so far the dialogue, the exchange of point of view has been great at the level of the United Nations, at the open of the working groups. Um, you're asking, you're describing in your question about the result of the outcomes are really good. Maybe the question is they are good enough. And I think uh, um, right now and in the next years, definitely we need to move on uh, and start to, as, as a, you know, as a state, we definitely need to, to demonstrate that our discussion, our dialogues can, I mean, offers to concrete um, step and solutions for for our state. From the perspective of Latin America, we're saying it was one of the key factors why 
uh, so far five states joined the POA. I'm pretty confident and positive that more states in our region they will understand this one, the, this proposal because uh, it fits quite well about the challenges that we have right now in our regions and with our needs. That's from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, I think that you, you underline one important aspect that we still need uh, to do um, kind of homework to, to, to raise a little bit awareness of, of uh, capacity building in our states, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, many agencies focus mainly on technical aspects of cybersecurity. And in fact, we need to build a resilience of our, um, uh, of our states and of our societies. And this is uh, 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 this is th there is a lot of to to do in, in this context. And thank you for your um, optimistic um, uh, view, your optimistic perspective on on, on POA. And yeah, as you rightly stated, uh, the the 2021 was good in terms of of uh, international debate, but it's not necessarily enough. So we have to do more. And now I'm wondering what is the EU, what is the Brussels perspective? Uh, how, how do you see importance of, of POA uh, uh, from 2021 onwards? Please, Dr. Pavlak, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Of course, I cannot claim to speak for the EU. I wouldn't even dare. I can uh, share uh, my uh, very modest uh, views on, uh, on the POA. And as you also said you know, in your introductory remarks, uh, I think I'm going to disappoint on the scientific approach to POA. I mean, <laughs> I would love there if there was a science to uh, to the discussions about POA that we're having these days, but unfortunately, this is not the case yet. Uh, so maybe let me start with a few observations and then answer to your uh, to your question, Mr. Chairman. So. I think my first um, comment would be that when I think about the POA, I uh, feel think very often about some sort of a mythical creature, you know, I do not really know what it is, or it seems to be the combination of several different elements. Even on this panel today, we have heard references to it as a platform, framework, a body. And I think if we really want to move the conversation forward and bring new partners on board, we really need to be very clear about the language and what this is that we're really talking about. Uh, and I think those different references are not really necessarily helping different uh, stakeholders in getting really clarity about what we're talking about. Now, the good news is that every meeting that we organize on POA, in my view, brings a little more clarity about what it is that we're talking about. So even today, I think I got a few answers to the questions I've been asking myself, and I will get there uh, in my presentation. Now, your question was about, uh, you know, how does the POA fit within the Zajol strategic competition given the, uh, the outcomes that we have had uh, in the GGE and Open Ended Working Group. And I think my first comment would be to maybe abstain for, from presenting the POA as an element in the geopolitical competition. I think we should be really very careful about how we uh, present it to the partners in the outside world, because I actually think the POA is the answer to, as Ambassador Vadia said and Katrin, to something that the international community has been really waiting for, this action-oriented permanent mechanism that will actually get uh, give us this kind of a get out of jail card, if you want. Uh, get, out, get out of jail card being, you know, always being stuck between the big powers negotiating and deciding whether we're going to go for the UNGGE or whether we maybe should engage in the open ended working group. This actually gives the whole international community this permanent structure that takes this uh, politicization of the debate really away and gives everybody a chance to participate. So I would, rather, I would, I would not present it as a sort of um, a, another element in this geopolitical competition that we have seen in the past, but rather as a departure maybe from what we have seen in the past and something that is supposed to complement indeed the discussions that we're having, but really set them on the content and the action as a cat said, rather than continue with this uh, politicized debates about the format. Of course, 
that's partly wishful thinking because the POA got already politicized, you know, that uh, uh, that uh, ship has sailed. We have seen at the end of the uh, open-ended working group that Russia and other uh, group of countries has been, have been quite outspoken when it comes to uh, uh, criticizing POA for exactly being this last minute addition to the conversation. Uh, and frankly, I think it's a compliment because it seems that uh, they are afraid and uh, they perceive it as potentially something that indeed would take this ammunition away from them in politicizing the discussion. But this observation comes um, with a few words of warning, I would say. Um, the concept note and even on the, on the panel today, some of the speakers were referring to the POA as facilitating implementation of the consensus framework for responsible state behavior. And I think there is a word of caution there. So yes, uh, we have the consensus reports, but I think we have to be very careful not to take those reports as everybody agreeing with the reports. Uh, the chair of the open-ended working group has published a report that clearly identifies where states have taken a, uh, different views and would like to see a separate path. In the national submissions by many of the countries, we also hear this uh, repeated statement, you know, with this deal, if you want, these reports are not ideal, but for the sake of a progress, we are not going to block them. And I think not blocking and being um, giving approval to something are different concepts. So we have to know that when we talk about POA as a way to implement something, this idea of implementation is already loaded and takes specific uh, position. And I think that is not necessarily so clear cut in my view yet, and there will be further conversation. But having said that, I think that indeed uh, the parallel track that will be taking place in the discussions in the open-ended working group could give us more clarity on actually where those agreements are, where do we still have certain disagreement, despite of course, everybody having voted uh, for the consensus report. Um, I think one, uh, one thing maybe that I think would be quite useful as well, as I said, in addition to this reference about the mythical feature, for me at least, would be to get an understanding whether POA is a goal or a tool. And I really hope that it's a tool, that it's a tool towards uh, strengthening states' commitment towards responsible state behavior uh, in cyberspace. But if it's a tool, then I would also think maybe if we have already certain mechanisms or examples from the outside of the UN as well, that could help us design and make this tool very effective. And I've been thinking about it. And one that came to my mind is really this uh, similarity of approach or thinking between the Budapest Convention and uh, the Glassy Plus program, for instance, which was really very much capacity uh, building focused. So if you think about the framework of responsible state behavior as a sort of a political commitment, similar to the one that we have in Budapest Convention when it comes to the fight against cybercrime, then the POA like Glassy Plus program becomes the mechanism towards the implementation. And where I think the important lessons lie are that you know when the Budapest Convention uh, was negotiated and signed, uh, mostly European countries have signed up to that, those from the Council of Europe. Nowadays, there are many more uh, countries that have either acceded or made their legislation aligned or compliant with the, uh, with the Budapest Convention. And that's thanks to Glassy Plus capacity building projects that have been implemented globally. I'm wondering whether there are lessons to be drawn for the POA. Can POA become the glassy plus, if you want, of the first committee conversation, whereby we through really this hard work through capacity building, we actually convince people that there is value in adhering to the framework of responsible state behavior, like many countries have understood the value of the Budapest Convention in their own fight against cybercrime. And I think that could be an interesting exercise to go for. I must say, I have not really uh, gone through it fully, so I'm sharing some of the ideas that <laughs> were born from my head uh, today, but I think there might really be something. and. Uh, the easier task here is, I think that the Budapest Convention and the criticism we hear is that it was negotiated by Europeans only. So there is a much 
uh, smaller buy-in. The framework of responsible state behavior, if we have, as we have heard, has been discussed in the UN for over 20 years. The open-ended working group report and the UNGG report got the, uh, gener uh, the uh, universal approval of the General Assembly. So uh, this uh, political buy-in is much higher uh, in terms of the first committee discussions. And I think that could be maybe one interesting avenue to try to, uh, to sort of gain more uh, political support for the idea. And I'll stop here and uh, look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pa Pavlak, for your political analysis, which I very much counted on. So thank you. Uh, I uh, let me mention one caveat you've made very, very interesting. Uh, Two reports have been adopted, but the question still remains whether everybody agrees on, on this report. This is a very interesting point of view. And uh, you are right, we have to be much more clear uh, about the language, um, whether it's a platform uh, um, framework, but you proposed uh, uh, something which, which I like very much, action-oriented permanent mechanism. It, it, it sounds very it sounds very good. We are running a little bit out of time in this panel and we have ahead of us a second round of questions, individual questions to each of the panelists. So my um, kind request is to, to limit your intervention to two up to three minutes, not 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 more. And let me again start with Ambassador Henri Verdier. The first question I would like to pose is following. Uh, France is a co-founder of a program of action and uh, had a great influence on its current shape. Um, I wonder what is your long-term vision of the POA in terms of membership, in terms of uh, structure and the main tasks which the POA is supposed to realize in the future. Uh, can we make certain projection, how would you imagine POA, let's say, in 10 years from now? Okay, in three minutes. You know, just one simple idea. Probably the POA was born in my mind during, a, so you may know that France did launch the Paris call for cybersecurity. And so here we have a huge multi-stakeholder organization with more than 1,200 uh, supporters. And one of them is the CTO of Air France KLM, Jean-Christophe Lalanne. And one day, Jean-Christophe told me, what did you do for me? Okay, you work hard in the IT nation. Yeah? I am more secure than 20 years ago. What did you do concretely for me? And in fact, that was the beginning of, can we end this uh, culture of catch me if you can? In French, we say pas vu, pas pris. If you don't see me, you don't catch me. Can, can we improve the security of the cyberspace, which we, we won't improve just with norms on international law? Because there is this kind of culture. And that's why Patrick was right. It's not a geopolitical uh, approach. It's not a block against another block. Maybe some big cyber power will be uncomfortable with, because maybe it will make more difficult <laughs> to enter in the system. But it's not block against block first. And then I, can, I say also to Patrick that, yes, we started with a very open and a simple proposition because we want to build this together, because we want to integrate new supporters and to listen to them and to take more and more good ideas. And yes, um, and, uh, and if some countries say that it was a last minute addiction, here they did lie, because in fact, we did propose with Egypt this idea, the first trimester of the beginning of the open-ended working group. So we are speaking about this idea since 290. So, and in fact, it's not our fault if someone did propose to make a second open ended working group without waiting the conclusion of the, of the first one. So, uh, that's, so that's important. So what I dream in 10 years, that's a very good question. We should always ask, what do we want in 10 years? First, I hope an inclusive uh, POA with every member state of United Nations. I, I need a POA that did help in 10 years all of these states to have a good search, a good uh, law 
and a good police and a good justice to protect itself and to better cooperate with other states. I hope I have a lot of ideas, but I have two minutes, so I conclude that we'll pro or we did in 10 years organize a better cooperation with the private sector and especially uh, to disseminate the best uh, practice and to promote a culture and maybe norms of good practices about security by design. Because as a former tech guy, I consider that, we, that security starts in the product. And I hope that we will be able to publish this index of cybersecurity because again, as myself, a former CTO, you know what? We know that some solutions are weak and that some solutions, a lot of attacks pass through this, every time the same solution. And we consider that it's time to publish this to engage a kind of race to the top and a, a good competition between companies. And to conclude, I hope that my friend Jean-Christophe Lalanne will thank me saying, now I feel more secure. Thank you, Ambassador. Just one, one sentence. Inclusive POA with full membership. This is our aim. And another question I'm going to address to Ms. Catherine Jones, uh, Duquette. Uh, the United Kingdom has a long and rich uh, experience and history in delivering um, development assistance. So let us come back to capacity building. and. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how do you see the importance of the capacity building within the POA and how it should, should be and how it could be realized in a practical terms, taking also into account diversified membership of the POA now and even more in the future. Please. Thank you, Miroslav. Um, so I thought uh, Pebble's comments on, on this angle were particularly uh, important. So. Obviously, the UK is committed to um, cyber capacity building internationally, and um, since 2012, we've committed more than £36 million, partnering with over 100 countries um, in this area to try and deliver this practical real work change that um, we're now talking about as, as part of the POA. Um, but we know states are increasingly concerned about the implications of um, malicious use of, of digital technologies, um, and concerns around the international peace and security angle, but also around human rights and, of course, development. Um, that concern isn't surprising because all states now really understand the transformational benefit um, from to economic growth and to sustainable development um, that such technologies can, can support and deliver. So it's increasingly vital that we find ways um, to harness those uh, the benefits of those technologies um, whilst preventing and responding to any misuse. And of course, to make good on those benefits, we can't simply ban those technologies. Um, so we need to help states develop capacities to use them in a responsible and a secure manner. And that's why capacity building has to lie at the heart of the programme of action. Whilst we've been working on this for some time together, we know that our efforts thus far, um, while significant, haven't really moved the dial in terms of sufficiently strengthening international cooperation to develop states' capacities. So the programme of action provides an opportunity to do more, to understand the diverse challenges faced by different states uh, in terms of implementing our framework for responsible state behaviour. To deliver on that aim, um, it will be really important to clearly map the specific needs and challenges faced by different states. And I think states could assist by reporting on their national implementation efforts, as Ambassador Vedio mentioned, um, so that we can really identify best practice and actionable recommendations for responding to the challenges that we share here. We believe that helping states to secure concrete support for capacity building efforts um, that respond to those challenges will also be a key element of, the, of this work. Um, so we need to mobilize funds, we need to match needs to solutions, and we need to coordinate efficient and effective delivery in line with the principles um, of capacity building agreed in the OEWG last year. That's no easy task, um, but there's still more we can do. Um, the program of action could have an advantage here, both through the increased political commitment it could generate and through its approach to inclusive participation, um, drawing together those who are already working in this sphere. So fostering meaningful engagement within the programme of action will bring expertise and resource that makes a practical contribution to our shared security. 
So to summarise, the UK believes that the programme of action has a lot to deliver on capacity building in this area, but we're only one part of the capacity building cycle. The programme of action will only succeed if we learn from states involved in the process how best to manage the needs and the expectations of the community so as to deliver those practical outcomes. And that's why we're committed to inclusive consultation on this issue, both through the upcoming open-ended working group, um, but beyond. So we look forward to hearing from, from others on how we can deliver this much needed promise uh, from the programme of action. Thank you. Thank you, Kat, for your perspective. And thank you for mentioning sustainable development, which linked uh, this discussion to, to the importance of SDGs as well. And uh, definitely political commitment is needed to, 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 to advance uh, our, our uh, job concerning POA. Um, let me now address um, question to Mr. Uh, Pablo Castro. Uh, Pablo, Chile belongs to the region which is quite prominently represented in the program of action in comparison to other regions. Uh, I wonder what added value do you see in this initiative from the regional point of view? What immediate benefit benefits it could bring to foster cybersecurity in your, but also in other regions? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Miroslav. And um, well, I still remember when we received the um, the, um, the proposal for the French Embassy here in Santiago about the POA, and I started some consultations and conversation with my colleagues from Latin America, Colombia, Ecuador, and Argentina. And we all agree that the POA was offered things that we were waiting for for maybe a long time, you know. Um, I will mention against capacity building, of course, but uh, um, the idea of having a permanent uh, the, uh, platform for conversation, discussions, the, be inclusive. The, uh, the promise of the idea that uh, from this POA, we, we can get something that could be important for our national policies and our own development. That's I think it was very seductive um, from, from the state in Latin America. We still have, I think, five states. I'm very positive we can engage more states in our region. I think Patrick is right when you say, well, what is the POA? I mean, we need more outreach in this case, or PR, I mean, maybe a website or something, and, and, and other people in states can know better about this, especially Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And from the perspective of Chile, and, and I want to thank Patrick, well, he mentioned the uh, Budapest Convention, the Glassy Glass Project, because I still remember that was once the reason why Chile decides to join the Budapest Convention, because national agencies, especially the prosecutor office was telling to us, look, I mean, if we are part of the Budapest Convention, we have also the chance to get training and capacity building for the Glassy Press Project and for judges and prosecutor office in the, in the cyber crime domain, which is very important and key factors from our, you know, um, first national cybersecurity policy. It was a very important elements also to join the Budapest Conventions. We have other elements, of course, but this was, was a key factor. And I'm, and I'm sure that was the same for other states in Latin America who also decide to join the, the, the treaty. And even I remember that when we are having conversation with other states and how good the Budapest Convention it is, it was also the promises about the getting that sort of collaboration, which is a key factor in our region and of course in other ones. So I think what Patrick said is, is very, very important. And, see, I, and also I remember the global forums have expertise to the find the members. It was the, the first time when we heard about this proposals in 2015 was, look, it was very capacity building oriented. Well, this is something we definitely do need, you know. Uh, at that moment, Chile was working the first national cybersecurity policy and during that process, the making this policy were quite clear that we definitely need a lot of assistance, exchange point of view experience with one other states. And there is something that has not been changed during the last years. And I think it's just kind of things for other states in, in our region. So for our same conclusion, that's probably the most important elements why um, we valid the uh, join the POA. Thank you very much, Pablo. And thank you for mentioning uh, once again the Budapest Convention. This is a very good example of, uh, I would say, um, a very wise approach of state to, to, to join international uh, legal instrument, also from the point of view of building uh, national capacity. 
it's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, we have five minutes, uh, three minutes for Patrick and two minutes for summing up our discussion. Um, Poland, as a member state of the European Union, highly values the EU engagement in development of the international debate on cybersecurity issues. Could you share your view? What role for the EU and its member states do you envisage in terms of further promotion and development of program of action? Please. Yes, and I'll try to be very brief to make sure that I don't use too much time. First of all, let me just add one more thing about Budapest and Classy Plus. I also don't want to leave everybody with the impression that we sort of um, merging two tracks from the third committee and first committee here. And I just want to be clear that I meant it more as a sort of a mechanism that I think was very successful in case of Budapest Convention and that might serve as an inspiration for uh, developing the POA and promoting it internationally. Uh, but uh, to your specific question, I, I think for me, the most important thing already that has happened with POA, and uh, I think uh, kudos to Henri for doing that, is really that we managed to reappropriate again the language of capacity building. I remember when the Russian resolution uh, about the establishment of open-ended working group was put on the table. It's basically capacity building after capacity building after capacity building. And I think it was a very sad thing to watch how something that is uh, such a successful mechanism, uh, let's say, uh, of the Western democracies got completely appropriated by a country like Russia that frankly doesn't even invest in capacity building. So that was, that was really quite uh, interesting to watch. And we have sort of abdicated that conversation slightly. So I'm very happy that we are sort of reappropriating it uh, again and putting our own uh, spin on it. Now, when it comes to the EU member states, um, I think the important thing for us to do is first of all, to be uh, to continue to be drivers of the process. The EU and the member states need to really take the lead in explaining to all states how this process benefits all stakeholder and how this is really this viable alternative to geopolitical competition that other big players are engaging at. Now, I think in order to uh, be successful at the end, we also have to be uh, credible and the EU needs to really demonstrate how the proposed approach can work in practice. And I think we have good examples for that already. So we have to start delivering and start using the examples of what's already happening. Uh, Ari is very familiar with the French uh, engagement in Senegal with the regional capacity building center that has been there for years now. There are many more projects uh, that the EU and individual member states have been funding. We have to really start showing that this uh, action oriented uh, capacity building focused approach can really bring results and then makes ultimately everybody happy. We do not have to wait for the vote in the UN General Assembly, in my view, that sort of rubber stamps the program of action to show everybody that this approach can work. I think we should follow the different logic. We should actually, while negotiating, should already be showing everybody that this is what we mean. These are the examples of how we think this action-oriented, uh, impactful model could work. And we want everybody to be part of it. And I think only then we can really get this uh, political support at the end of the day. And I think final for the EU, I think it would be a big miss if we didn't try to become much clearer or define more clearly the role we see for the regional organizations in the POA. Uh, EU being regional organizations itself, I think we have this mandate and I think maybe even responsibility to show everybody how regional organizations can play a role. And I think uh, we should really uh, uh, take it uh, more seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. We managed to re reappropriate language of capacity building. EU as a driver, driver of, the, of the process. Very two important um, statements. We need to finish. Uh, let me first of all thank our distinguished panelists for your participation, for your engagement and for sharing your very rich uh, perspective on, on, on the POA. And let me thank our audience here in, 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 in this room and uh, everybody who followed our event online. Thank you very much.